Amen. Amen. The Bible says in Philippians 4 to make your request known unto God. Of course, He already knows. He has all power. Let's open our Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 30. Deuteronomy chapter 30. No answering machines when we call the Lord. Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 1. And it shall come to pass when all these things are come upon thee, the blessing and the curse which I have set before thee, and thou shalt call them to mind among all the nations whither the Lord thy God hath driven thee, and shalt return unto the Lord thy God, and shalt obey his voice according to all that I command thee this day, thou and thy children, with all thine heart and with all thy soul, that then the Lord thy God will turn thy captivity and have compassion on thee, and will return and gather thee from all the nations whither the Lord thy God hath scattered thee. If, it any, if any of thine be driven out into the uttermost parts of heaven, from thence will the Lord thy God gather thee, and from thence will he fetch thee. And the Lord thy God will bring thee into the land which thy fathers possessed, and thou shalt possess it. And he will do thee good and multiply thee above thy fathers." And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed to love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul that thou mayest live. And the Lord thy God will put all these curses upon thine enemies and on them that hate thee, that which persecute thee. And thou shalt return and obey the voice of the Lord and do all his commandments which I command thee this day. And the Lord thy God will make thee plenteous in every work of thine hands, in the fruit of thy body, and in the fruit of thy cattle, and in the fruit of thy land for good. For the Lord will again rejoice over thee for good, as he rejoiced over thy fathers. If thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to keep his commandments and his statutes, which are written in the book, this book of the law, and if thou turn unto the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul. For this commandment which I command thee this day is not hidden from thee, neither is it far off. It is not in heaven that thou shouldst say, Who shall go up for us to heaven and bring it unto us, that we may hear it and do it? Neither is it beyond the sea that thou shouldst say, Who shall go over the sea for us and bring it unto us, that we may hear it and do it? But the word is very nigh unto thee in thy mouth and in thy heart that thou mayest do it. See, I have set before thee this day life and good and death and evil. In that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments that thou mayest live and multiply. And the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land whither thou goest to possess it. But if thine heart turn away, so that thou wilt not hear, but shalt be drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I denounce unto you this day that ye shall surely perish, and that ye shall not prolong your days upon the land, neither uh, whether thou passest over Jordan to go to possess it, I call heaven and earth to, re to, record, to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life, that both thou and thy seed may live, that thou mayest love the Lord thy God, that thou mayest obey his voice, that thou mayest cleave unto him, for he is thy life, in the length of thy days, that thou mayest dwell in the land which the Lord sware unto thy fathers, 
to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob to give them. So our message this morning is choose life. Father, we thank you for your word. Help us to choose your blessing. But Lord, I pray for the unsaved here today that they might be moved to choose life. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. When uh, Paul wrote the letter that we call 1 Corinthians, he was writing to a church that the Lord had used Paul and his missionary team to start. Uh, they'd gone to that Greek city. They'd preached the gospel. Uh, they'd seen sinners converted. They were baptized. They were then formed into a functioning New Testament church. And this was sometime around 50 A.D. That means that the Gospels, all four of them, and much of the New Testament were not yet written. The Bible that Paul used to preach and teach in the church at Corinth was the Old Testament, including this passage that we're reading right here. That's what he taught to them. And I think it's very important that we see the significance of what Paul wrote to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians, what we call chapter 10, verse 11. So he, he said to those people, Not all the, Now all these things happen unto them, that is to Israel, for in samples. And they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world were come. So Moses spake these words to Israel. They are written down for the generations there. But he says the church at Corinth, they were written for their admonition and that they're written for our admonition. Now, there are many churches and preachers today who have basically set aside the Old Testament for teaching because they don't think it's profitable for modern Christians. However, the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, and that's explained by this, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. Uh, Peter wrote in 2 Peter 1, 19 to 21, We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well to take heed, as unto a light that shineth in dark place, until the day dawn, until the day star rise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time, that's in the Old Testament, by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And so the idea that the Old Testament is not profitable for us is it's worse than ridiculous. It's, it's a rejection of the Lord himself. The context of much of the Old Testament, of course, is the gods dealing with a nation who were the descendants of Abraham. We, we had the time before that, the, what we call the fathers, but most of it is dealing with a nation, uh, like I say, the descendants of Abraham, Jews. Uh, the people of Israel primarily became citizens, though, by physical birth. That's something we need to remember as well. It was not by spiritual conversion. Uh, they had laws that governed their civil conduct, their diet, their courts. Uh, they actually had, of course, an army to defend their nation. So very different from a church. And many within the nation of Israel, of course, were spiritually converted and they knew the Lord by faith. Verse 6, I think, demonstrates that. The Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed to love the Lord God, thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul that thou mayest live. So that's, that's genuine spiritual conversion he's talking about. However, though they were a, a uh, congregation, Israel, of course, was not set up like a New Testament church. It's very different. In a true church, a New Testament church, People become eligible for membership by repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. And then if they're baptized, 
but they maintain that they can, if they continue in obedience uh, to the doctrine of the apostles and the carrying out of the Great Commission, that's what's required for church membership. Uh, Israel was a testimony to the world, particularly during Solomon's time, about God, but they were not charged with a Great Commission like churches are. They, they both had that same purpose, but it's not really charged and given such uh, understanding and responsibility like churches are. Now, my point in uh, saying all this is that though the function and the practices of the Old Testament Israel were different, again, the Old Testament uh, gives us eternal truth. And it's truth largely that is illustrated by types or what we could call object lessons, the temple and so forth. And I think that's, again, that's the reason we're going to, what, why we're looking at this or what we're going to learn from this here in Deuteronomy 30 um, is that this, this instruction that we have here is specific to Israel, but God reveals himself and God reveals his character and even the, the nature of the true nation of salvation is revealed in this chapter. And it, it therefore reveals what he expects of us. And so it can't be put aside. By God's gracious prophetic offer of his blessing to Israel in time and eternity, God reveals the truth of his promise to save all who choose life by choosing to love God and to cleave to him and to keep his commandments and to know God and to spend eternity in heaven, all of us must choose life. And so there are two major points. First, we're going to look at Israel and see how this is prophetic proof of God's promises. And then secondly, we're going to uh, look at God's gracious call for sinners to choose. Those two things. So a prophetic proof here of God's promise to Israel. In, in verse 1, we have a reference to the scattering of God's covenant people. It says, It shall come to pass when all these things are come upon thee, the blessing and the curse which I have set before thee, and thou shalt call them to mind among all the nations, whither the Lord thy God hath driven thee. So uh, in previous passages, and here in verse 1, at the end of the verse particularly, it says that if Israel did not obey God's law, uh, he, was, he was drive them out of land. He would scatter them all over the world. Uh, he, he promised this land to them, but if they didn't obey, they were going to be scattered. And of course, jo Joshua, the book of Joshua records the the uh, capture of the land, the conquest of the land that God promised to Abraham. Abraham kind of wandered around there for a while, but he promised that his descendants would receive it. But later, several times throughout history, because of Israel's disobedience, Israel was defeated in war, and its people were taken captive, and they were scattered. So when was that? Well, when Babylon was in existence when the Persians ruled the world, when the Romans did. Now remember, the Romans took control of uh, the land of Israel before Christ, but they came and completely leveled Jerusalem in 70 A.D. E even beyond that, in closer times, the Germans during World War II really sought to exterminate the Jews. And uh, greater uh, fulfilled this and so the execution of this warning by God is one of the strongest examples of prophetic fulfillment. People say, I don't, I don't believe the guy is just, the Bible is just a bunch of old stories. No, it, it's a statement about what was going to happen and then it was carried out. And an even greater example of that is the gathering of God's repentant people in verses 2 to 5. He says, and shalt return to the Lord thy God and shall obey his voice according to all that I command thee this day. If they do that, thou and thy children with all thine heart, with all thy soul, 
then, that then the Lord thy God will turn thy captivity and have compassion on thee and will return and gather thee from all the nations whither the Lord thy God has scattered thee. If any of thine be driven out to the uttermost parts of heaven, from thence will the Lord thy God gather thee and from thence will he fetch thee and the Lord thy God will bring thee into the land which thy fathers possessed and thou shalt possess it, and he will do thee good and multiply thee above thy fathers. So though the defeat and the scattering of Israel is prophetic evidence, one of the irrefutable and amazing examples of prophecy is this rest restoration of Israel to the promised land. Uh, we know, as, as I just mentioned, for example, the Jews were defeated. They were scattered all over that part of the world, uh, it's recorded in several Old Testament books, but we've got two books in, specifically, um, Ezra and Nehemiah. They were specifically re written to record Israel's return one of the times. Uh, they rebuilt Jerusalem. They, re they rebuilt the temple, and they did that by command of a Persian king, a guy who was, you know, initially at least uh, a pagan, but then, of course, hundreds of years later in 70 A.D., both the temple and Jerusalem were laid flat by the Romans. Uh, and so, though they were scattered into many nations, the Jews still maintained their identity. This is, is a marvelous thing, too. I mean, if, how many think about how many nations have been destroyed and have ceased to exist? There's nobody that thinks of themselves still as citizens of that nation, yet Jews are, are that way. They maintain their identity. And these dispersed people, dispersed in the A.D. 70, in 1948, they became a nation together. Again, 1,878 years later, after not being a nation. How many days did it take them to do that? Six days. The six, that's what it's called, the Six Days War. This is, this is nothing short of a miracle. It's nothing like it anywhere in history. And so there was a gathering of God's repentant people, and part of that too is the, the blessing of God's people when they're obedient, as he says in verses 6 to 10. He says he's going to put all these curses on them, but when they return and they obey, Verse 9, the Lord thy God will make thee plenteous in every work of thine hand, in the fruit of thy body, in the fruit of thy cattle, in the fruit of thy land for good. For the Lord will again rejoice over thee for good as he rejoiced over thee, if thou shalt hearken. Now, Israel is not a very big country. It's about 8,019 square miles, uh, supposedly. Uh, that's 969 square miles smaller than New Hampshire. It's not a big country at all, but yet that nation is still the focus of the world. Uh, when you look at Nobel Prize winners, those are people who are recognized by the world for outstanding scientific achievement. 22% are Jews. One out of five of Nobel Prize winners, a little greater than one out of five, are Jews. Uh, they are a nation there that's completely surrounded by enemies. You know, this whole thing about from the, the what to the sea? The river to the sea. The river to the sea. There you go. They, they, all those nations just want to totally exterminate the Jews. They're still there. They're still thriving, actually. They're, they have a free market economy that's very uh, profitable. Israel, in fact, has the second highest concentration of high-tech businesses, second only to Silicon Valley. They're just smart people. It has large resources of natural gas. Israel actually exports natural gas. Oil diamonds, minerals, and yet their population today is only uh, about 9,200,000 or something like that. 
<laughs> pretty prosperous, pretty profitable, even though they are not serving the Lord today. But one of the greatest promises, prophetic promises here, is the bless, uh, the availability of God's gospel of grace. If you look at verses 11 to 14, it says, For this commandment, which I command thee this day, it is not hidden from thee, neither is it far off. It is not in heaven that thou shouldst say, Who shall go up for us to heaven and bring it unto us, that we may hear it and do it? Neither is it beyond the sea that thou shouldst say, Who shall go over the sea for us and bring it unto us, that we may hear it and do it? But the word is very nigh unto thee, in thy mouth and in thy heart that thou mayest do it. Now, again, the Jews are descendants of Abraham. He was the friend of God, and because of that, the Jews continue to this day to have great privileges. The word of God came from the Jews. We have 66 books in the Bible. Only three of those books, if we're figuring rightly, only three of the 66 books were written by Gentiles. Everybody else was a Jew. And I'm including, of course, Job in, in that because uh, he's after Abraham or about the same time. Uh, they had the temple. They had the priests. They had the sacrifices of the Old Testament taught to their nation and practiced in Israel. They had the place... The only time it's ever been that way, except for his little literal presence in the Garden of Eden, they had the glory of God manifested in the temple there. Uh, that's not at Notre Dame or anywhere like that. That's not in the mosques, any mosque around the world. Uh, God sent the prophets to Israel, and God revealed God's prophetic plan for human history by the Jews. Uh, virtually the entirety of the ministry of Jesus the Christ was carried out in Israel. God incarnate in Israel. He, it appears that he may have ventured outside the border of Israel a couple of very short times, but other than that, every, every day of his life, uh, well, of course, he did go into Egypt. His parents took him there. But God made himself known to the world through the Jews. And what a great privilege. What a tremendous blessing, an, un, an incomparable blessing among all the people of the world. And he gave to them, and we find in the Old Testament, the explanation of the choice of faith. If you look at verse 15... Excuse me, turn too far. It says, See, I have set before thee this day life and good and death and evil. And that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways, and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, that thou mayest live and multiply, and the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land whither thou goest to possess it. But if thine heart turn away so that thou wilt not hear, but shalt be drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I denounce unto you this day that ye shall surely perish and that ye shall not prolong your days upon the land whither thou, goest, whither thou passest over Jordan to go to possess it. I call heaven and earth to, re to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both thou and thy seed may live, that thou mayest love the Lord thy God, that thou mayest obey his voice, that thou mayest cleave unto him, for he is thy life and the length of thy days, that thou mayest dwell in the land which the Lord sware unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them. Now, what we see from this passage is something that Jesus made abundantly clear in the New Testament, and that is to love and to worship 
and to obey God, th this is the outflowing of faith. It's the fruit of faith. And though many in Israel's history certainly made their religion just outward ritual, uh, for example, like the Pharisees in Jesus' day, uh, even though that's true, God was always clear about what he wants from man. It's stated uh, in verse 6, verse 16, verse 20. He wants us to love him. He wants us to cleave to him. He wants us to obey him. There's, there's no mistake about that. Now, though Adam sinned and brought the curse of death upon this world, it was God's plan to, to redeem and to bless those who turned to him in faith. And so Job even came to earth to live as a man and die and redeem us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. If you want to know what belief is, he's explaining it. He's laying it out for us here in this passage. And so that brings us to the application to us today, and that is God's gracious call for sinners to choose. Now, back in verses 1 to 3, as we've already pointed out, we have the proof, really an undeniable historic proof of the truth of God's promise. God says, if you disobey, I'll scatter you. If you turn to me, I'll receive you back and bless you. And that, that can be there's no way anybody could challenge the fact of that, that God said that was going to happen. That's what has happened repeatedly. Uh, and so really the proof of the fact, if somebody says, well, where is God? You know, well, just look at the nation of Israel. How did people come back from all over the place when there was no nation, when they had no government, had no army, had none of those things? How did they become a nation? How do they continue today in the midst of all these bloodthirsty savages around them? Well, it was prophesied and it's been fulfilled. Uh, and he's gathered people that were scattered all over the earth. Now, I, I point out to you, there's still today millions of Jews all over the world. Even though there's a nation around over 9 million of them there, there's Jews all over the world still today. And the Jews today as a nation are in unbelief. So he's blessed them and brought them back to the land, even though they really do not love him with all of their heart and soul. That Yes, there are saved Jews, but Israel's a nation is not anything uh, like an obedient people who loves him. And because they do not love him, they reject, they are rejecting salvation through his son. God still kept his word. In John 1, the Bible says in verses 10 to 13, He was in the world, and the world was made by Him, and the world knew Him not. He came into His own, that is the Jews, and His own received Him not. But as many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man. It's not by being a descendant of Abraham, but they're born of God. God continues to show his favor to Israel, and yet he will continue to judge them at the same time until they receive their Messiah in repentance and faith. And God's historic dealings with Israel illustrate they prove this promise. They prove, they prove that this is true that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. It's, it's proof of all that, of the word of God. And yet this passage also makes a very powerful statement about the true nature of God's call. Again, it would I could just start reading again, but in the interest of time, verse 6, it says, The Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed to love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and that thou mayest live. And the Lord thy God will put all these curses upon thine enemies, upon them that hate thee and that persecute thee. And thou shalt return. And it goes on. 
In verse 16 to 19, he does the same thing. Um, he commands us to love the Lord, and there's blessing that follows from that. And so, again, God wanted Israel to love, to worship, and to serve him. Um, it wasn't that he wanted them not to eat catfish or shrimp. It wasn't that he didn't, you know, they, they, he just wanted people to be circumcised. And th- or they, these were things to teach spiritual truth and to show that they did love him because they o- obeyed these things when they were right with him. And he promised, as we see here in this chapter, to give each of them a transforming conversion if they would repent of their sins and if they would love him above all else. If they did turn to him in love and obedience, the obedience of faith, he would greatly bless them. That's what verse 7 to 9 says. And again, it's, it's repeated more than once in here. He says, The Lord thy God will put all these curses upon thine enemies. Verse 8, Thou shalt return and obey the voice. Verse 9, The Lord will make thee plenteous in every thing in life. Now, let me ask you this. Is love and obedience too much for God to ask of us? To anyone here that's holding out, is is God the God, the creator, the one who supplies us with everything? Is it too much for him to ask of his creation that we love him and obey him? I think people would probably read this and they get angry that he says he's going to punish you if you don't do that. <laughs> he's God. If you can see today, you need to thank God. And I can tell you, it's not. This is, this is the right of God to demand this of us. But what we have to understand still is the reality of this demand. And that's laid out for us in verses 17 to 19. He says, But if thine heart turn away, so that thou wilt not hear, but shalt be drawn away and worship other, other gods and serve them. And that other gods informs, includes a perversion of who Jesus is. If it's something other than biblical Christianity, he says in verse 18, If that's true, I denounce unto you this day that you shall surely perish and that you shall not prolong your days upon the land whither thou passest over Jordan to go and to possess it. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing, Therefore, choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. The reality is God will judge us if we do not take his offer. The greatest experiences of life and then eternity are promised by God to those that choose him, who love him, who cleave to him, and serve Him. And this is His right as our Creator. He's holy. He, he sacrificed Himself to redeem us. Romans 5, 8 says, But God commendeth His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners. In the, in the time that we were in rebellion against God and blaspheming Him, He died for us. But you know, John 3.36 says this, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. And Hebrews 10.31 says, It is a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. And so that's the reasonable decision 
is given there in verse 19. Choose life. Choose life. Do you know the Lord is your Savior? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this simple chapter full of truth, full of explanation, so common, it's just common sense, it, it makes sense. And Father, I do pray for any person here today who's really not cho chosen to repent and to trust you, surrender his or her soul to you, that today you would work in that heart and life and bring conviction and saving faith. And Father, help us who do know you to never give in to our own deception, deception of the world, but that we would cleave to you, love you, serve you, obey you. Help us to be faithful witnesses of your great grace. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.